today. Woo-hoo! You could have been anywhere, like your warm bed right now, and you chose to come here and worship with us. So we appreciate it, and the Lord smiles down on you for that. Uh, let's uh, let's open with a word of prayer this morning as we stand to worship. Uh, Father God, we just uh, thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we have together. Uh, we just ask that uh, whatever struggles uh, each of us is going through this morning or worries that we have of what's to come, uh, that uh, we can set that aside right now and give it give it over to you, set it aside to, um, to worship and praise you because you are worthy of that praise and that worship and uh, that, uh, that getting close to you, um, putting, putting the worries aside for just a moment to, uh, to get to know you. Uh, we just ask again for a, a great time uh, gathered together as, as friends and believers in Christ. And uh, we say all this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. Amen. Are you ready to worship this morning? Yeah.
each time I wiped all the tears away Stepped in and saved the day But once again I say yeah And it's still raining The lights are from the roads I barely hear the whisper through the rain
we're torn sometimes through struggles, and uh, we still need to praise Him during those struggles, right? Yes.
everybody it is good to see you this morning all right I hate to break it up it seems so nice you're so friendly you're so you're so nice all right well God bless you welcome everyone and welcome to those of you that are joining us online on uh, Facebook perhaps on YouTube YouTube's a little later but Facebook is live ish Depends on our internet connection, but we, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, everyone here this morning. Uh, we're going to have a good time. It is uh, our annual chili cook-off. Um, I don't know why it's off. Uh, it's just first annual. Can you call it an annual if it's the first one? All right, we're, we're, we'll, we'll do, we're doing it anyway. So we're breaking the rules if you can't. So uh, we're just living crazy like that. So we're going to have a fun day. It's going to... Uh, I don't know how are we do judging. Are we doing the judging like we have uh, post-it notes. Do we have a ballot? Do we have Dominion voting machines? <laughs> you can tell by your laughter. Some of you have a good memory. Um, all right. So we are <laughs> we are wrapping up a weird series. Okay. So um, I had uh, I planned to, to finish this series on impact, on the impact that the body of Christ has had on the world. And it's just a little different. It's a little, it's a little different series. And uh, I was talking with a couple people yesterday. I'm like, yeah, I might kill it. I just might kill it now. I don't know. And uh, they said, well, what were you going to wrap it up with? And I told them, and they said, oh, we think you should do it. So if you don't like this, totally not my fault. Um, if you really don't like it, I'll give you the names. Oh, they're volunteering. All right, okay, right back here. Um, I didn't, I didn't know if you were into this, but if you haven't been here for this, uh, what, we're, what we're talking about is what would the world look like if there were no Christians, right? We sometimes hear people say, well, you know, the world would be a better place if there just were no Christians, or, or perhaps even if Jesus had never come. Oh, it's all you religious folks. You know, I, I agree, the religious folks are sometimes a problem. Come on, somebody, right? Uh, but, it, but it's all the, you know, churches and preachers and Christians, they're just ruining everything. And so we've taken a few weeks and we've looked at the impact that followers and disciples of Christ have had on the world uh, around us. And, um, and, and it's, it's, I, I don't even have the words. It is so significant. The world would be uh, a much, much different place had Jesus never come and had there never been disciples that took his words uh, and their discipleship seriously. So I recognize maybe two or three weeks in, it just sounds like patting on the back and a bragging session, like, you know, Christians are just better than everyone. I don't really mean to make it, I don't really mean to make it sound like that, but we are a part of a glorious history and tradition of, of making the world a better place. Not me, uh, but us and generations of believers that have gone before us. So this morning, um, because someone else said that I should, um, see how I'm not taking the credit. That tells you how confident I am in this message. Um, we're going to look at this question um, and examine the claim. Have you ever heard this claim before? That more people have been killed in the name of Christ than any other name. Can I get a show of hands? Anybody ever heard that statement? If you haven't, that's good. Maybe we're, maybe, maybe it's not going around anymore, but... Yeah, more, I've, I've heard that, I don't know how many times. More people have been killed in the name of Christ than any other name. Um, I didn't jot this down. Uh, I do want to mention that, that those 
that have called themselves Christians throughout history, the track record isn't spotless. We'll touch on it just a little bit later. The track record isn't perfect. It's not as though Christians have never done anything to make things kind of worse, right? We've, we've botched it a few times. Um, but without going into great detail on that, I, I should um, be careful to say that a lot of things that were done that were negative in the name of Christ were professing Christians. Like we would probably take issue whether those people were actually born again disciples of Jesus Christ. So, you know, that argument can be made. We won't get into that. Um, but we'll just say that, you know, our, our record isn't spotless uh, over the last 2,000 years. Um, we could talk about the Crusades. We could talk about the Inquisition. Um, I'll give you some numbers um, on some of that stuff briefly in a little bit. Um, what else? I don't know. Which trials? Um, there have been some things through history, again, professing Christians, not necessarily people that took um, the Bible seriously, partially because they couldn't read and didn't know what the Bible said. Um, but I want to begin this morning by uh, taking a look at Psalm 14. This is a Psalm of David, and he says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Anybody ever heard that yeah. scripture, scripture before? Um, we like that one. That one's kind of fun. Like, it's nice that God gets a little jab in there, right? And we go, there, there the Bible proves that there's a God because it says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That might not prove that there's a God, but we do like David's attitude, right? Um, and I, you know, I like that. I like that first part. There's, there's got to be something, something in there somewhere that just says atheism is a bad idea. But, but if we read, if we continue the verse, there's actually some really important things that follow from that sort of, uh, you know, David's kind of gotcha moment. He says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And we like that. And we kind of stop there. But look what it goes on to say. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand or any who seek God. Verse 3, and all have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. This is, of course, an uh, Old Testament passage, David speaking here. Um, with Jesus and the infilling of God's spirit, uh, we do have a new capacity to actually do good and seek God. But, but David is talking about our sinful nature and how we are corrupt and how by default, we're not godly people. Someone has said um, that there is no, uh, has been no other era in, in the history of mankind like the 20th century in terms of man killing his fellow man. Millions were killed by other human, human beings in the last century. And that is a conservative estimate. So if you're visiting with us here this morning, um, I don't try to you know, use a little humor and I don't try to sort of keep it light because I learned somewhere that that's the best way to grow a church. Um, I sort of do that by default because that's just what my personality is. That's just, that's just who I am. I, I like that. That's, so when, when we, this series has kind of been weird for me because we've gone a little dark a few times. Anybody with me? Like the whole, like the first whole, the first whole one was like all about death, right? Um, and, and, and we're not done yet. So it's going to get, it's going to get, it's going to get ugly up in here this morning. So I just say that to share with you my uncomfortableness with all the death this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us, uh, I, I hope you don't go away and go, wow, there was so much death in, in that sermon this morning. I don't think we'll ever try that place again. It, this is not typical. Uh, but, but having said that, bring on the death. Okay, here it is. Um, so, so, what we're, so what we want to look at this morning. So we looked at the contributions that Christians have made, how they value human life. We've been made in God's image. And, and how before Jesus, uh, life was exceedingly cheap. And I feel like we made a compelling argument that without the arrival of Jesus, uh, it would still be a really, really dark 
and ugly place. We talked about the contributions that Christians have made as far as their generosity and charity and giving to people, expecting nothing back, unheard of really in the world um, before Jesus taught his disciples to live that kind of lifestyle. We talked about how Christians, uh, disciples of Christ, have brought uh, civilization and, and, and raised the standard of living wherever they have wherever they have gone. We've got some, some cool quotes about that this morning, if I can stop talking here and get to them, because they're at the end. So I gotta, I gotta keep moving. Um, but, but I wanna look at the world that, or, or parts of the world that have tried to erase the footprint of Jesus, have tried to erase the influence of the body of Christ. So millions have died because of atheistic ideology. Um, whether it was Hitler, whether it was Mao Zedong, um, as he attempted to liquidate Christianity in the Cultural Revolution. Um, now, modern technology has made us more efficient at killing one another, and so science and technology, which we talked about last week, uh, modern science wouldn't uh, be here without Christianity. That's a shock to some, but now we know better. So modern technology has made us more efficient in killing more people, and so that can partially be responsible for more deaths. Um, but most of the atrocities, that, at least that we're gonna talk about this morning, the biggest atrocities, I'll put it that way, in the 20th century happened because modern man rejected God, all right? Someone said in the 18th century, the Bible was killed. In the 19th century, God was killed, um, referring to uh, the philo uh, philosophers of the day and saying that, that God was dead. So in the 18th century, the Bible was killed. In the 19th century, God was killed. And in the 20th century, man was killed. You get rid of the Bible, then you get rid of God, then it gets pretty ugly for mankind. So wherever atheism has had a stranglehold on the world, um, there is a negative impact. So remember, we asked the question at the beginning, uh, or we said, we, we talked about the statement. Um, there have been more bloodshed, more lives lost in the name of Christ than, than anywhere else in the world. And uh, we're going to find out if that's really true this morning. You can probably guess where this is going. I, I'm going to tell you this. I didn't jot this down on my notes, but uh, a memory stirs of a time that I was talking with someone about the things of the Lord, and, and this came up. And it's, I've heard it a number of times in my life, but after I studied some of the things that we're gonna, that we're gonna talk about this morning, uh, somebody brought this up. And let me just say, um, it, it's probably partially due to my still fallen and sinful nature, but it was quite enjoyable to be able to have this information at the ready when someone spewed out that old platitude that more blood has been spilled in the name of Christ than, than any other name. And as I recounted some of these, not of course by memory, but some of the ideas, um, this individual, I mean, the, the, the countenance changed as they realized uh, I've believed a lie that so much blood has been spilled in the name of Christ. Some has by his uh, so-called believers. Proverbs 23, uh, seven says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Um, so the way that we think, the things we focus on, the things that we dwell on, they uh, have a way of coming out in our lives. Our lifestyles will, will reveal the kind of things that we think about. Now, I know most of the dumb things that I've done, I didn't think enough. Come on, somebody. Amen. Now, if you said amen, that was for you. That, that, was a, that was, you weren't just amening the, the dumb things that I did. Um, but, but, right, so, we, so what we think about ends up very often manifesting in our lives. And so if we remove the scriptures and we remove God and we remove spirituality and um, there, there's no constraints, there's nothing to guide us as we think in our hearts, that's, that's what we become. That's who we are. As people think in their hearts, that's the kind of world that they will live in. We are the results from our thinking. And our greatest results flow from our thinking about the things of God. Um, consequences flow from unbelief and disbelief in uh, God and godly living. 
Someone said, this way, said it this way, when a person denies the existence of God, he finds himself suddenly in a materialistic universe. The atheist has dichotomized the universe, gotten rid of the spiritual half, and has been left with only the material universe, which is nothing but matter in motion. Now, I want to say, and I've, I've said this uh, a number of times, but this is not to say that every atheist that you know is going to stab you in the back, not figuratively. Literally, they're going to get you. If you, you better watch those atheist friends of yours, you know. They're all unspeakably evil, okay? We're not saying that. Are you with me this morning? I know some lovely atheists. Um, and uh, I, I know some, some fine atheists. Sometimes an atheist is someone who just doesn't happen to buy it. They just don't happen to buy it. They're not, um, you know, all desirous of, of exterminating all Christianity. They're not all uh, wanting to get into to debates and make you look silly and superstitious for believing in the big man in the sky. Um, in fact, uh, I've shared with many of you um, some of the people that I follow, the books that I read, and some of the videos that I watch, some of, of the people that I respect a great deal. I can't say this in church, never mind. You're not mature enough to handle it, I don't think. I see Connor back there nodding. I'm like, dude, you got to check this guy. I, I love it when an atheist agrees with me. I love it when an atheist says, you know, we need morals. We need constraints. And I love it when an atheist said, you know, it's really good that religion came along. Because religion gave people something to center their lives around, form a community, and build the great civilizations. And it brought us to this place uh, of living uh, and elevated living because people had a common thing that they centered themselves around. And even some atheists that I know of say, you know, thank God for religion. I, those might be my words, not theirs. Um, but can appreciate religion. Jonathan Haidt is a, a great guy. If you want to check him out, a, a, a fine fellow. He just doesn't happen to believe. But as uh, I've got several of his books and he recounts a number of different things. And I'm like, I agree with that. All but the not believing in God part. I don't believe in that part. Um, but, but how we should treat each other well, how we should give people grace and things of that nature. I don't know that he uses the word grace. That might be the Christian word for it. Um, but, but I, I, you know, good guy, uh, Camille Paglia, who's a little crazy in some ways, says that I don't happen to believe in God, but I read the Bible. It's a beautiful piece of literature. I read it as literature, and it's a shame that the people who actually believe in God don't read it more. So the idea that your Christian friends are reading the Bible more than you, ooh, you know, that, that stings a bit. But the idea that Camille Paglia, the atheist, reads the Bible more, more than you, that really, that smarts, right? So I'm not saying that all atheists are, are horrible people. But what I do want to give you is something uh, of a history of atheism. And let's really see if it's true that there's been more bloodshed in the name of Christ than in the name of, of nothing. So David, uh, we started with David in Psalm 41. He said, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And then he goes on to say that they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile and there is no one who does good. The book of Judges, you'll be familiar with a number of times. It says that in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as he saw fit. In other words, there was no moral constraints. There was no leadership. There was no there was nothing exterior that was guiding and leading people to live moral lives. And I think that's David's point here when he says that they are corrupt, their deeds are vile, and there is no one who does good. Because without some moral constraints, we're a mess. We are a mess. There is literally no reason for you to live a moral life if there's no God. I've heard some arguments that say, well, it's just, it's better to, you know, to get along. Like maybe there's no God, but we still shouldn't be murderers. And we still should, I mean, if there were not a government that would enforce those kinds of laws, um, it's just, it would make the world a nicer place. Um, I, I think you're borrowing some ideas from Christianity, even if you take that view, because if there's no God, then there's no reason to be moral. And there's no reason to be kind to anyone. There's kind atheists. 
we're all, we're all, I don't want to be misunderstood here. There's some fine, lovely folks that are atheists. They need Jesus. Anybody with me? Amen. All right? They need Jesus. So I'm not, I'm not saying that they're all corrupt. But really, if you, if you follow the thinking, there's really no reason for me to, maybe I'll pretend to be nice, but the moment I have an opportunity, I'm going to get you. I'm just waiting for my chance. And whatever I need to do to you or anyone else to get ahead, it's totally justifiable because why not? Uh, I'm glad that everyone who doesn't believe in God uh, doesn't live that way. Again, as we've stated, I think, for these full five weeks, that they may be borrowing something from Christianity, as some atheists that I've mentioned already will freely admit um, that the world is a better place because Christians, they might say religion, maybe not narrow it down to just uh, Christians, but that religion is good. It's, it's better for the world. The world is a better place because of it. So if atheists can, can uh, understand that, then we should probably have some understanding of the difference that we've made in the world around us. All right. So is it true um, that more people have been killed in the name of Christ? Friends, I think I've let the cat out of the bag already. I accidentally skipped ahead of my notes, and you probably already know that there are far more that have been killed in the name of atheism than in the name of Christianity. Uh, the numbers killed by atheists totally dwarf the number of those killed by professing Christians. Um, someone pointed out that the term genocide didn't even exist until the 20th century. How could you commit genocide. Um, well, we, we had the ability to at least give it uh, uh, the good old college try. All right. Joseph Stalin uh, slaughtered more than, we got numbers people, so I'm not a numbers person, um, but you'll probably be running the, the totals in your head as we go. Um, Stalin killed more than 40 million, 40 million people. Now, the entire Inquisition which is, you know, we could, we could talk about that. I'm not going to defend the Inquisition this morning. Uh, we'll just, you know, take the blame for it, I, I suppose. But the entire Inquisition was reported to have killed 30,000. Now, 30,000, that's, let's see, still 30,000 more people than I've killed. All right? Look at the preacher bragging. Look at him. Oh, oh, the preacher, you're so good. You haven't killed anybody. Ooh. 30,000 is a big number, right? 30,000 is a lot. That's a lot of people. Inquisition, about 30,000. But let's keep this in perspective. 30,000 you can lay at the feet of Christians. And we'll do some other math here in a minute. Um, but it's generally agreed upon that Stalin killed um, somewhere around 40 million people. Of course, we um, would be remiss if we didn't mention Adolf. He killed Jews, of course, gypsies, most of whom were professing Christians, Slavs, Poles, and others deemed racially inferior. The first victims of the Holocaust, here, I'll, I'll have a quiz for you here in just a minute. Um, the first victims of the Holocaust were 70,000, 70,000 uh, of the mentally ill, or what they deemed incurable people. Now here, you can, you can help me kind of finish this statement. Um, at that time, which was really, um, um, what Hitler had done really began with youth, euthanasia. We'll just, you know, kill the people that are, are weak and having trouble and the mentally ill. Um, the only courageous public voice against the killing of the mentally ill came from, can you guess? Right. Actually, this, this came from, I didn't check this out, but I read this from a, a good source, came from two Christian leaders. Maybe we shouldn't just kill people because they're having mental problems. All right, um, two Christian leaders. I feel like that, that number should be higher. I feel like there should be more, um, but at least there were two, right? Um, so the Holocaust actually began with euthanasia. By the end, six million Jews and nine to 10 million others. Many were Christians, were liquidated. No one knows for sure the exact number of Gentiles. And then we get to China. It's estimated that Mao Zedong alone killed more than 70 million Chinese. And then I've got this broken down when he did it. I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessary this morning. Um, we'll save a little time and, and cut those details. But about 70, like it, I've got like the, he did this group during this period and, and so forth. But if, uh, if I may, 
uh, 70 million Chinese people murdered under Mao Zedong. Did I mention we're having a party today? <laughs> Ray. <laughs> Nothing makes you feel like partying. Like the death. Okay. Um, so uh, there's, you know, math, math, math. Um, we get to about 72 million human beings from Mao Zedong. By the way, um, Hitler, godless, uh, Mao Zedong, atheist, Stalin, you know, uh, godless, atheist. Um, and then there's the communist takeover in Cambodia. That was only said to kill about two or three million innocent people. Um, and then there's really no way to count all the numbers that were slaughtered in other communist, atheist uh, revolutions and communist-sponsored war. So you got Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Cuba, Czechoslovakia. Um, can I get a shout for Czechoslovakia? Yes. Anybody from Czechoslovakia here this morning? All right, yay, we have one from Czechoslovakia. Right in my, how often do you put Czechoslovakia in the notes of your sermon and your buddy from Czechoslovakia shows up? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't plan that. All right. Um, Hungary, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and numerous other nations around the world, okay? Around the world. I gotta stick to my notes because I'll get my numbers wrong if I don't. So Mao killed about 72 million, 40 by Stalin, Hitler's, yeah, 15, it's hard to say for sure. Um, we come up to a number around 127 million people. And uh, so then, yeah, so then with other atheistic totalitarian states, um, we, can, we can safely round that up to 130. And where I got this information from, the atheist numbers are conservative, right? They're pr pretty like, you know, it's not. And, and I, I think I jotted this down. Um, those that supposedly were killed by Christians, those numbers are rounded up. They're like the most liberal figuring of the numbers. I, I hope I included that here this morning. All right, so if we were to add the dead from the wars of the 20th century, the number would easily jump. Okay, so then you have to add the people in the wars that like Hitler killed all those innocent people, his own people, but then there was that World War II uh, thing that happened. So if you add um, the innocent people that they killed, in addition to the wars, we get the number of about 170 million, all right? Um, but we can take out the war stuff and um, I'm going by this author here, and we'll just stick with the 100, 130 million figure. All right, I better read this or I'm gonna botch it. All right, using the most exaggerated criteria and numbers, one could come up with no more than 17 million people uh, killed, 17 million people killed by professing Christians. Still a big number, 17 million, 17 million. Not, not proud of that, um, but I wanna tell the whole story. Um, in the supposedly, you know, in the name of Christ, um, in the 20th, in, sorry, in the 20 centuries of Christian history. So I, even though I read it, I still botched it. So let me go back. Um, 17 million uh, have, been, have been killed by professing Christians in the name of Christ since Christ. 17 million, I'm not dismissing that number, but in 2,000 years, people who claim to be Christians botched it 17 million times, right? But over 2,000 years. So when, we, so when compared to the top estimate of 17 million allegedly killed in the name of Christ, we see a huge difference in the estimate of 130 million killed by atheist communist regimes in the last century. Over 2,000 years, 17 million, large estimate. Um, conservative estimate, the totalitarian reg regimes killed 130 million in just 100 years. That's eight times more um, the number of people killed at, in a much, much shorter period of time. I want to jump back to this idea, Psalm 14, um, where David seems to suggest that if there is no God, corruption and negative things follow that. And just this morning, I said, you know what, I'm going to take a look at this. I'd heard about this new 
uh, bill that's being proposed in Canada. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. So Canada already has, I don't recall the name of it, but it's an assisted suicide, assisted suicide law. Now you can go back and look at the last four weeks and I don't need to re-preach that for you. You already know what, what we would have to say about that. Um, Christians have always stood on the side of life. And the new bill is, that is, or the addition or the expansion of their suicide bill. So it, presently, it is if you are terminally ill and you're suffering from something that there is no cure for and you're just an awful, debilitating, horrible pain and there's no end in sight. Canada has said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to pass legislation that will allow you to be to commit suicide with, with the assistance of a physician. So the expansion is for mental illness. And so I, I read a little, some, some neutral stuff, I read some stuff against. And one article that I read, not even intentionally, might have almost just been pro or just fair. And man, it's just weird. And so with mental illness, um, you can get to, it could be the homeless, it could be those that are poor, um, folks that are having a problem, and it can even extend to, there's no age limit on it. So even, um, I forget the term they use, like mature teens or older teenagers are, uh, would be um, covered or allowed under this expansion of this legislation to uh, have physician-assisted suicide all without uh, the knowledge or uh, you know, without the knowledge of the parents. So you have a child who's depressed I mean, if you know, depression and anxiety going up all over the world. It's not just here. Um, and they're an older teen. I don't know what the cutoff would be. Um, but without a, a, a parent's permission. Now, what's weird is I read stories about parents that actually signed off. Like the one young man I think I read was, I think he was like in his early 20s. might have been 21 or something. But he suffered from depression. And he was lonely. Thought he would never get a girlfriend. Somebody said... Um, I don't know if it's the same guy, but, but one young man, younger man said, uh, I, I don't think I will ever have anyone to love me. And he wasn't even talking about romantically, just like nobody loves me. And that is indeed sad. But even a young person doesn't need their parents' permission to go and have a physician assist them in taking their own lives. That's what Canada is getting ready to allow. Now, this is going to sound like a joke. It's not. It's... It's kind of weird. Fortunately, the health care in Canada is so bad, the waiting list uh, is so atrocious that if you decide to kill yourself, it might be years before a physician is found available. I guess we could be thankful about the state-sponsored health care in Canada as a result. That's not me making a political joke. Um, that is what I read about this, their system. And I read the story of one young woman who has suicidal ideation, thinks about suicide uh, quite frequently, and, but she's afraid of it and she's terrified. And she's like, she doesn't want this law to pass because she's afraid that she will uh, use that law to end her own life. It's like the fact that, that it's not allowed under her present condition, although she thinks about it frequently, she, she can resist the temptation knowing that there's not physician assisted that would be available to her. And so she's terrified that this law will go into, and it probably will, that she will um, take advantage of it. Um, I believe, I'm, I'm trying, I didn't jot this down, but I think it was her story, and she said it was something like she was trying to get psychological help and counseling and see a therapist about these suicidal thoughts, but she was like a year out from getting the help that she needs and the counseling for someone to say, maybe suicide is not the answer. So there's the, she can't get help, but she'll probably have to wait in a long line if she decides to have a physician help her with her suicide as well. And young people, the wait for a therapist is even longer. And what's really dark and ugly about this is that it seems like, I mean, I want to be fair, but it seems like this may be being done because there's already such a burden 
on their health care system. Like if you are helping someone with their mental health from the time they're a young person and through their 20s and 30s, and like that's going to add up. That's expensive. And it, it seems to be the case that it's cheaper for the government-sponsored health care to help you kill yourself than the cost of trying to get you healthy in your mind and help you with what you're struggling with. Um, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. And what does David go on to say? That they are corrupt, their deeds are vile, and there is no one who does good. Without some moral constraints on us, things devolve rapidly. And if you're shocked by my Canada story, that's, that's, I mean, that's good, that's healthy. That's because you've, whether you're a Christian or not this morning, you've probably, if, you're, if it shocks you, you've probably been influenced by um, a Christian culture or, or, or a culture that has at least been influenced by Christianity. All right, let me share with you this quote. So more than a century ago, James Russell Lowell, a great literary man who was the Minister of State for the United States to England, was uh, at a banquet where Christianity um, was being attacked and, and scoffers were mocking Christianity. He spoke up and said, and this, this quote in a way, and I know you all haven't been here for the series. Some of you are like, well, thank goodness for that. Um, but they were mocking Christianity at this, uh, at this banquet that he attended. And uh, he famously stood up and said these words. And this, in many ways, summarizes the last four weeks. He said, I challenge any skeptic to find ten, a 10 square mile spot on this planet where they can live their lives in peace and safety and decency, where womanhood is honored, where infancy and old age are revered, where they can educate their children, where the gospel of Jesus Christ has not gone first to prepare the way. I want to read that one more time because for emphasis, but also because I didn't do it very well the first time. Um, he said, I challenge any skeptic to find a 10 square mile spot on this planet where they can live their lives in peace and safety and decency, where womanhood is honored, where infancy and old age are revered, and where they can educate their children, where the gospel of Jesus Christ has not gone first to prepare the way. If they find such a place, he went on, then I would encourage them to emigrate thither and there proclaim their unbelief. Doesn't that kind of summarize um, what we've been talking about the last several weeks? Um, it's easy in the safety and the comfort that in so many ways Christianity is responsible for. By the way, those of you that are visiting or just tuning in, I didn't say every good thing was invented by a Christian, right? You can kind of give that impression. Like, it's, it's not as though Christians are the only ones that ever do anything around here, right? So I didn't say that, but monumental, extraordinary, huge leaps forward. Um, we're not, you know, the only people valuable on the planet to God, right? Um, and so we're not, we're not suggesting that. But what we are saying is that uh, many folks borrow from our belief system, borrow from our values, then judge us as, as not meeting the standards, that they're borrowing from us. And in reality, and I think we've, we've shown that, that had it not been for the influence of Jesus and his disciples, the world would be a much, much different place. And so with that, I want to encourage you to vote on November the 8th. That is this Tuesday. There are some important things uh, on the ballot. Um, I want to encourage you to prayerfully uh, consider. So, um, you know, I've run this through in my head. Nobody has said this. But should we be political in the pulpit? You know, that's a question that I've, I've gone back and forth on that in life. I've been political in the pulpit, and then I've stepped away from it. Um, I, I still believe that 
if we, if we back uh, a political party or individual, it's gonna embarrass us, right? A human, if I back a human, they'll always embarrass me. Um, Jesus has never embarrassed me. So, uh, but issues, issues are worthy of speaking, speaking about. So prop one, I have views, they're political. I'm not going to share them. Prop two, I have views on that, but they're political. Figure that out, <laughs> right? It's not a moral issue. So I, I feel strongly, but I'm not gonna burden you with that. Um, I, but one reason is, I think I'm right. But since it's a political thing, eh, who knows? I'm right, just so you know. <laughs> that was just, you know, I'm just, you know. Um, prop three is a moral issue. And so uh, it would enshrine um, what appears to be limitless or broad um, abortion in our Constitution. Um, I first mentioned this weeks ago and said, look, you, you may be in the place and you may be pro-choice. I'm not saying that you need to be pro-life. I'm just saying this thing is sketchy, scary, it's poorly written, it's confusing, and it, it, I believe it is a Pandora's box uh, that can get ugly. Um, so I would encourage you to prayerfully, I need to say prayerfully, because prayerfully, prayerfully um, consider whether God would have you if God's even interested, I submit to you that he is. Um, if God would say, you know, you ought to go vote for abortion on demand with no limits and for uh, no age limits, no parental consent, just the, the most uh, broad abortion. I've heard some people say in the world, I don't know if that's true. Um, but it would certainly be, it would certainly make abortion more, uh, I don't, it's available, the word. Um, for those of you that are pro-life, it would, it would be worse than when we were under Roe v. Wade. Um, I, the way I understand it, I think it's dangerous for the women that go in for abortions as well. Uh, the, the, the sanitary standards and the rules and inspections to make sure that a place is clean and safe. There's none of that in this, in this constitution. So um, that could be ugly for the pro-choice uh, people as well. So I encourage you just to, to pray about it. And I will also just add, don't forget to pray uh, to vote for your school board folks too, huh? Yeah. Wink. <laughs> If you think I'm not gonna remind you about the school board when my wife is running for school board, you're, that's, you're silly. You're just being silly now. <laughs> uh, I didn't tell you to vote for her. I just said you might wanna prayerfully consider. I'm still, you know, I'm on the fence, but. <laughs> she's, starting to, she's starting to win me over. <laughs> I've asked for bribes, but you know, I, I'm, probably, I'm probably gonna vote uh, for her. So, um, Tuesday, November the 8th. All right. Um, all right, God bless you. I'm gonna ask, uh, is Kenny coming up? Kenny is gonna come up and, and minister and share uh, for communion. Thank you, Kenny. Can I actually have the, the whole worship team come up too? I don't like to do this alone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's all about me. Hey, good morning, everyone. I know I already welcomed you all and said good morning, but I'll say it again. Some of you might have been out getting coffee or cooking chili or something. Um, so I just, I just have a little something prepared for communion here. Um, I'd like to ask, I would say I'd like a show of hands. Uh, that might get embarrassing, so I'm just going to say it as a rhetorical question. Who loved the song uh, we sang earlier, Whole Heart? Okay, some of you are raising your hand. Okay, so it wasn't... Everybody, if everyone said no, bro, you know, that would be awkward. Um, well, those, um, the lyrics to that song, I, I've loved that song for a while, uh, but the lyrics this morning kind of jumped at me, so I'm like, okay, that's what I got to talk about in a minute. Um, just some of the lyrics say, 
Once I was broken, but you loved my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me, but your grace holds me now. The song then goes on to explain, and that grace holds the ground where the grave did. I just, I, I, they just, like I said, they jumped off the page at me yeah. this morning. Um, through Jesus, his, his perfect life, his death, his burial, and then his resurrection, sin no longer has a hold on our lives. Amen. We have God's awesome and amazing grace so let's, uh, let's go to scripture. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And then Romans 5 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank God. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for reconciling us to our creator. So while we prepare uh, to partake in communion together, uh, I want us to sing this song again, or, or part of this song again. And uh, I want us to like see those lyrics or, or feel the scripture um, a, a little differently than maybe when we first heard it. Uh, sometimes we come in and, and you have other things on your mind. You're, you're not thinking deep enough on, this, on the words that are said. You're, you're coming in and, and singing. And uh, I mean, for us, we come in, we practice at home, we come here and we hear, rehearse it. And sometimes when we sing it at 10 o'clock, they, they sometimes just become words. Um, this morning, that wasn't the case for me. Sometimes it is. Um, but, but I looked at these words just differently. Once I was broken, but he loved my whole heart through that now sin has no hold on me because his grace holds me now.
Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all take the bread. raise the cup. After supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's, let's take the cup. Scripture goes on, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you all. Um, just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, actually, not really any announcements. Um, the only announcement is stick around after church. We have the chili cook-off. Uh, how, many, how many things of chili are out there? Nine. Nine. Nine, nine competitors in this chili cook-off. So can we, all, can we figure out who's judging this thing? I think we vote. There's everyone. Sticky notes. Oh, so. every, oh, okay. So this is an all-inclusive. There's no I judge need, panel. I need more money for Brian. Yes. <laughs> um, the only other, so it's, uh, this is the fall harvest party. So we're, we're having a chili cook-off. There's some other things to eat out there. Um, are we playing games? Are we, I what? think we're hanging out. I, there was talk of a bonfire. Oh. Yep, the fire is started oh, out wow. there. So you want to, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You want to eat lunch? You can take your food up there. We're gonna have benches up there soon, um, and then the kids' activities will be starting after we eat, so I can get those set up. Very cool. Pin the stem on the pumpkin. Oh! Uh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I, I had to come up with something. That was is falling. there is there bobbing for apples? No, oh. I was that's told that's post COVID. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> I, think a little I, I was gonna say. Bobbing in other people's saliva. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never heard me as a kid. Um, <laughs> or the, other, the other the other announcement is it's in the bulletin um, and and Pastor mentioned it last week. I think it was last week. Jenny Barnes, um, her father passed away uh, back in October. I think that was a long time. Back in all the way back in October. Um, October seventeenth, he passed away. The service was this past weekend or yesterday, yesterday. right? Yes. And uh, so just continue to keep her in prayers. Um, some of us know losing, losing a father or, or a, a parent is, is tough. Losing anyone is tough. But uh, a parent um, that, you know, she struggled with uh, taking care of him and, and stuff. So that, um, but just keep her in your prayers. And uh, Doug. Um, uh, we prayed for Doug last week, yep. then I talked to him Monday, and he said he was doing way better. Yeah. And there's no, there's no natural.
natural explanation for that. I mean, I would take an actual natural explanation. I'll take anything for my brother not being Amen. paid, but it was Amen. prayer. Um, he still had some pain, but it wasn't. It was far less than what he was experiencing. So that's what I prayed for. It was mini prayer. That's all. That. All right. Um, we don't. Uh, we're not going to pass a plate. We haven't done that for quite some time, but. Um, we uh, would like to remind you that you can give here in person. We have plates uh, situated near the exits to, as a reminder. And you can also give online, Facebook, on our webpage, on YouTube. You can give. Um, and we appreciate that so much. God bless you for your faithfulness in giving. Um, last week I completely forgot to even mention <laughs> the offering. Um, so. I'll mention it twice this week. No, we won't do that. Um, that's yeah. unnecessary, but just a reminder. And then Milan, what do you want to say from Czechoslovakia? Tell us. I just really what I want is for you to confirm that everything I said is totally true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can, are you convinced? Are you convinced, Jeff? I have to start with the song of David. Yeah. Number 14. Once I was the fool, I told in my heart there is no God. My mom was very godly person. Right. She loved Jesus. I was making fun of her. I said, how you can believe there is God? Oh, she said, Lord, forgive him. He just don't know what he's saying. Lord, did have to bring me here to hear the gospel. I was going to church every Sunday she met me. I still remain that fool. Till God brought me here and spoke to me in a real voice. And I accepted him as my Lord and my Savior. And I called my mom. <laughs> Mom, I got best news for you. She said, Yes, my son, I just accepted my Jesus as my Lord and Savior. She said, Oh, glory, it took me 23 years. <laughs> <laughs>
they need to stand up for life. I want you all, I didn't want to really do preaching here. <laughs> but God laid it on my heart to say those things. And again, Christianity is really not religion because there are so many religions. Christianity is a faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty God came as a baby to die for you and me. That's what it's all about. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Milan. I, I love your accent. Everybody can't understand an accent. I love accents. Um, but if you didn't catch all that, just catch him after. At our party. I don't know if they're planning on staying, That's but if you start to talk to them, you grab him, they'll, they'll stay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, tell, me, tell me what you said again. I didn't catch all of it. And yeah, they're not going anywhere. So uh, we, we want to close with a song. Uh, if that's all right, and then what? Then what? Then what do we do? Eat oh, chili. Somebody, what do we do with chili? Do that, all right, we'll figure it out after this. <laughs> all right, we want to close with a song. Thank you. 